to the address on the screen, and uh, they'll be read to the panel. Um, and if you, and if uh, just for courtesy, if you can please silence any communication devices. Uh, before we uh, kick this off, um, we're fortunate to have in the audience tomorrow's leaders in their cadre, who are now part of junior and C senior ROTC programs from across the great state of Hawaii. It will, I'd like to take a moment and recognize them. So cadets, if you could please stand this morning and be recognized as I mentioned your school. Farrington High School. The Governors. Kailua High School. They're probably still surfing. Uh, Waipahu, Waipahu High School. Kaiser High School. They're probably on the, joining the uh, Kailua War Riders as well. Roosevelt High School. All right. Mililani High School. Surfing up to. And Iaea High School. Shoots. Everyone's on the beach. Okay. In all seriousness, mahalo for your dedication to serve and hope you continue the proud Hawaii tradition of great military leaders from Hawaii, such as current U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth. And Punahou. Apologize. The Buffin Blue. Punahou, please stand. Much apologies, Mr. Colonel. <laughs> Mahalo for your dedication to serve and hope you continue the proud Hawaii tradition of great military leaders from Hawaii, such as US, current U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth and Medal of Honor recipient, the late Daniel Inouye. Your ROTC unit is following in the historic footsteps of the 442nd Regiment Combat Brigade and the 100th Infantry Battalion. Go for broke, the Purple Heart Battalion the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in the entire history of the U.S. military. So thank you. Now it's my honor to introduce Jeff Bloom, AFSIA President, Hawaii Chapter. Aloha and good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. It's our third day of TechNet Indo-Pacific and also for our Coalition Interoperability Forum. Today we have a panel of what we were talking about earlier, four of our Five Eye countries represented, and so we decided to do this together, both with TechNet and Coalition Interoperability Forum. So one of the things we said was earlier, there will be, uh, if you have questions later on as we get to the end, there's the text that you can send the questions to. So this morning, we'll have David Buckley from KPMG as our moderator. David manages their federal risk strategy and compliance practice, and he wanted to talk today about managing risk in a coalition environment. So without ado, I'd like to introduce David and welcome him. Just, are you going to come up here or are you going to moderate? We're from here. Okay. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Good. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you everybody for your time. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for getting up early and coming out to uh, participate in this panel this morning. Uh, we are really have a unique opportunity with several of our mission partners uh, represented, the countries represented. And of course, when we're talking coalition or an engagement in a coalition, sometimes these folks might be engaged, sometimes uh, they might be leading, sometimes they may be uh, not even in, not involved at all. So. When you talk about coalition, I think one of the things we're going to explore this morning is what is a coalition? How do you presuppose membership in a coalition? And then what happens uh, further down the road as an event occurs where other partners come in and join suddenly and they've not been part of that, that trust uh, engagement or even understanding how the different uh, organizations or countries work bilaterally or in a multilateral uh, fashion. So we're going to talk about those sorts of things this morning. It's really my pleasure to, uh, to moderate this panel. It's a lot of, going to be a lot of fun, I hope. I do encourage you not to wait to the end to put your questions uh, into the system. As questions occur to you, feel free to send them into that email address. There'll be uh, 
reviewed and sorted and racked and stacked by the folks in the back, and then when we get to the time for audience questions, we'll start addressing those. So please don't wait till the end, because then we'll have that big pregnant pause of, of audience questions. Um, I am very happy to be uh, joined this morning with representatives from Canada, the United States Army, uh, United Kingdom, uh, and Australia in this conversation. As I said, I think when you look at the overall conference, and particularly the Coalition Inter Interoperability Forum that was running simultaneously, there's been a lot of conversation, uh, uh, mostly by Americans. Um, so having, having other countries represent their views and experiences in this conversational environment, I think, should be beneficial to all of us, and also um, our ability to listen and take in what their positions or uh, observations are. We can all learn uh, together. So from, uh, let's just starting down at, at the far end, down there, uh, Colonel Aaron Osborne, the United States Army, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, is the Chief of Interoperability and C4 Engagements, so obviously somebody that knows what we're talking about, specifically in quite a bit of depth. Next to uh, Aaron is Lieutenant Colonel Tim Minion from the Australian Defense Force, and Tim's got a, a varied uh, background with technology and, and engagement uh, in coalition operations, so we're very happy to have him here. Uh, Mike uh, Maxwell, Colonel, you know, uh, Canadian uh, Forces, Maritime Deputy Communications Information Systems, um, Information Warfare and Cybersecurity, uh, based out of Victoria, British Columbia. And last but not least, uh, Professor Patrick Baker, UK MOD, He's from the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory and uh, has both uniform and civilian and private sector experience. So we're really happy. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, joining us this morning. So as I said, uh, just kicking off the conversation, uh, what we wanted to start talking about was trust, trust in a coalition, because without trust between the partners, trust between the countries, and actually down to the individual humans engaged in operations, whether they're military operations, contingency operations, or responding to a uh, uh, humanitarian assistance or disaster recovery event, um, we've not only got to know and understand roles and responsibilities, but since we're counting on each other, nation to nation, organization to organization, they're obviously in a coalition environment, you're gonna have NGOs and others, non-traditional actors uh, assisting in, in operations. How do you get a baseline of trust and how do you maintain that baseline of trust early on? Now I know this is a technology conference and everybody's really honed in on technology solutions. But until you have the basic framework around uh, not just requirement setting, but the, the organizational uh, approach and international approach to addressing the situation that you're all charged with doing in a coalition, unless you've got that documented, understood, and actually trained to, the technology really doesn't matter. It's really the process, uh, the risk management that we need to undergo um, as we're setting up this these situations. So my first question is going to go to uh, Tim. Tim, will you just uh, explain in your, from your perspective, and I, oh, by, the, by the way, I guess we should say that the, the opinions and information that are expressed up here are our own. They don't represent our, our individual nation states uh, and, or the, my firm, KPMG, so there's just a little <laughs> caveat that we're responsible for our own co uh, conversation input here, and if you've got questions about those things, please see us. Okay, Tim, so back to the question. From your personal experience in, in uh, operating a coalition environment, what are some of the, the things that you've learned and seen that really have to be established early in those relationships from a baseline standpoint? Yeah, th thanks, Dave. Just uh, from a context perspective, uh, I'm the, the J65 at Headquarters Joint Operations Command in Australia, so uh, sort of my, the lens that I, I bring to this is a, very much about um, ADF, uh, on operations, so I'm not a not a capability guy necessarily, um, but I certainly we think about it in terms of um, how to support um, ADF operations globally. That's what what, what the job does, uh, including co including coalition operations. From a trust perspective, from from the way that we look at it, um, I think it's all about uh, achieving it through repetition. So you can't you can't turn up into a coalition. Um, and expect to have trust between the coalition if it's not something that you practice regularly. So what we try to do is establish across a, um, you know, throughout a training year or throughout a couple of uh, training cycles, whether that's uh, a 12-month cycle or a, or a three-year cycle, 
to make sure that we're training with likely coalition partners. Um, so through repetition and baselining, so we have a good understanding of each other's um, cultures and the way that um, military culture mainly, so the way that militaries operate because um, each, each individual military, even in the Five Eyes community, we all operate either at least slightly differently and in some cases quite differently, um, both from a um, basic military perspective but also from a CIS technical perspective. We bring our own equipment, we bring our own, um, uh, you know, the way that we communicate. So the, the best way to get through the trust barrier, establish trust, is, is really through repetition, making sure that we identify and train with each other over a number of years. Um, we develop relationships um, with our counterparts and each of the, um, the, the likely coalition countries. Um, we spend a lot in the Australian Defence Force, we spend a lot of time uh, working with Indo-PACOM, working with um, all of the Indo-Pacific countries and their respective, um, certainly from my um, perspective, the J6 side, but I, would, I can tell you now on the, on the operations side and on the maritime side and on the, um, the air side, they do the exact same thing, which is build strong relationships, personal relationships with your counterparts in the coalition. So that when we do have to come together as a war fighting um, uh, force element, that we've got, we've got already built those relationships. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'm gonna throw the same question to, to uh, Patrick. Patrick, uh, in your experience, maybe some vignettes about uh, coalition operations. Um, maybe yes, feed on that uh, information, but also maybe talk about what happens when when that trust that has been established is either damaged or breaks. Okay. Okay, so the UK position is very similar to the Australian position where we do look at it, who are likely, who are gonna be likely coalition partners across all of the different forces. Um, I think lessons learned from Afghanistan for the UK were quite brutal. Um, that was obviously a large coalition operation. Lots of people joining at different levels. Um, I suppose, some of the problems that we run into, and I also just out of interest do some work with the Irish Defence Forces, which is obviously not part of the UK, if you're confused at all. People do get a bit confused over it. Um, that do a lot of NGO-style operations, so a lot of disaster relief, that type of stuff. So they're continually working with um, unusual coalition partners throughout the world. But from a, an absolute UK perspective, we, we absolutely try and identify who we're going to possibly be working with. Obviously, within the traditional Five Eyes element, it's quite straightforward. Despite what Tim said, the equipment is slightly different. Some of the doctrine is slightly different. I think, think the issues from Afghanistan in particular is the level that we interoperate at. Um, we, inter we tend to interoperate at what we consider to be our operational IS level. That's na not tactical CS, that's not radios on people. Yeah, which is where we would really like to interoperate with everybody. I don't think that's readily doable for at least the next five or six years, despite large procurement programs underway throughout the world. So, example, the US WinT, in the UK LE Taxis. Um, some of the tr trust damage you, you can see, so some of the operations in Afghanistan, um, particularly uh, if you want to push it to its absolute limit, operations involving things like joint fires, so where you're using different coalitions, to operate different systems. So it could be fire control from say um, US, it could be Italian artillery, it could be UK troops on the ground. Um, reputationally wise and obviously damage, um, the last thing you wanna cause is fracticide, i.e. killing your own troops mm -hmm. or killing somebody else's, which unfortunately is a fact of war. Um, if you look at Gulf War One in particular, um, everybody's got their own way of operating their own, if you like, flexible front line. So it's understanding that these things will happen. Yeah, it, it will happen. No matter how clever we are at integrating, it will happen. Yeah, and it's something that you have to understand that is a risk. Um, we're not all gonna suddenly change our doctrine so we're all identical. For example, certain UK units, um, 16 Air Assault Brigade, for example, our airborne unit, technically is a part of the 82nd Airborne um, Division. So the, the doctrines there are fairly close. So it's, it's understanding those situations will happen. Yeah? You are going to cause reputational risk. You are going to cause um, political risk. Yeah? You are going to cause, to be honest with you, and it's gonna be done in the public's eye. Um, we all understand now that after the Vietnam conflict, every conflict we're involved in is done live on CNN. Yeah? It's no good trying to hide it after. 
Thanks, Patrick. Mike, um, in your experience from Canada, obviously, and I guess I should say it, it's an obvious statement, you know, we have four of the five five eyes up here, but uh, so there, uh, we are used to operating closely, collaborating constantly, exercising together and working not just in an exercise environment, but about actual operations for, I would say, 100 years, for a long time. So, th so the relationships between countries have existed. Um, Tim talked about the establishing personal trust and getting to know your counterparts on a coalition. Mike, can you talk a little bit about, from your experiences, how important those relationships are, uh, but I, I still want to come back into what happens when trust or whether it's through misunderstanding, accident, or whatever, what happens when that trust is violated or broken? Um, I, there's, I presume there's got to be a plan to reestablish the trust. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, the, um, my, ex my recent experience over the last uh, probably decade, or actually more than that, I've, I've been heavily involved with the uh, Royal Canadian Navy and participate in this maritime uh, multinational IP interoperability working group, which is a big title, but it's basically a coalition of 16 plus nations, you know, out of a pool of 52 that it tends to evolve over time. So we meet twice a year and uh, and it's all about information exchange, and uh, we've evolved from what was you know, the four eyes and five eyes forum, and uh, we've really learned that getting together face to face is critical. Um, the nations that have more matured IS security standards or cyber security standards tend to, we try to share as much as possible so that that uh, allows the, the group to evolve and uh, that we can raise up to have at least a solid minimum information assurance standard. Um, the challenge is as networks are changing to where we had traditional, where you went up on Centrix uh, uh, Maritime Forces Pacific, or CMFP network, which is an established traditional network, now we're going into the FMN and mission partner environment where we're gonna be sharing services, uh, you know, where we're actually gonna be allowing other countries to reach in and grab services. Um, the challenges on the technical side, I think, are, are significant. Um, but the issue of, of, of trust, and lots of times you don't know what you don't know. Um, nations are very hesitant to share vulnerability information because that's gonna um, provide exposure that they don't want. Uh, and we've even at times have asked uh, validation that you've met what we consider the minimum standards that no one's willing to, certainly the Five Eyes nations are willing to share that. Um, the non-traditional allies aren't. Um, the face-to-face -face is really critical as we're dealing with allies that are culturally different to us. Um, we've in fact, when we send CEOs of our ships out Prior to, prior to taking command, they usually come to the Asia Pacific Center here so that they can get some concept of the different cultures. We have an embedded Asia Pacific advisor within Maritime Forces Pacific Headquarters that before ships deployed, you know, they, they give the command team a cultural brief and to understand the nuances of interaction. Well, thanks, uh, Mike. Aaron, uh, so Mike touched on some, uh, some issues there, but what I'd like you to sort of unpack and from your experience is when you've got the, these relationships, particularly the non-traditional uh, countries or elements coming into a coalition environment, is there a deliberate process to establish that trust? So, so Mike said that we've got some of these new uh, non-traditional entities that are reluctant to share information and why in your experience Aaron why is that what what do we need to do to get to a point where we've got that trust built up it's not just about the system because you can all, we all have systems that we trust internally it's how do I to get it get to a position where I'm giving other people access to those systems or that information how do we mature that approach in your experience yeah, thank you. So I, I guess in my experience, especially out here in the Indo-Pacific, um, dealing with multi, 
national partners and some of those non-traditional partners, um, establishing trust through policy, doctrine, um, strategies, um, looking at some of those agreements that can be put in place prior to the forming of a, of a coalition helps us build that trust. You know, starting at the national level, if there's an agreement done from a, a national to national um, that then trickles down to a mill-to-mill -mill type of engagement or opportunity, I think that's what helps build and, and formulate that trust up front. Um, out here in the Indo-Pacific, um, whether it's through our key leader engagements, um, whether it's through some of the operations and exercises that can occur um, down from our service components and, and with the uh, other nations, that um, up front uh, enables us to establish and, and build that trust. So I think it's, it's those type of events and activities, those operations, um, that will enable us to get after um, establishing and formulating that trust with those partners that may not be used to operating in a coalition environment or operating you know, with a non-traditional partner. I can tell you from, from recent engagements with you know, some of the uh, countries here, um, they're, they're willing to uh, have the dialogue, but actions speak louder than words as well. And so as you put something down on paper, you have to follow it up with those actions that will enable to uh, continue to build upon you know, those things that you've set forth for trust. Right, T Tim, um, can you follow up on that? One thing, it's, it's great to have policies and treaties in place that drive behavior, if everybody abides by them, but how do you get from that paper to actually implementation? How do you, how do you figure mm -hmm. out, you know, what are the minimum standards that have to be in place yeah. to enable this, uh, these coalition, at least communications and, and operations? Yeah, okay, I, th I think to answer that question, you probably need to, you need to understand how coalitions are formed. Um, so it's, it's rarely, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to my left and right if you see this differently, but it's, it's rarely a military decision to form a coalition. So it's, um, it's very much a, a political or governmental decision um, for what the coalition would look like. So all of those elements of national power, only, the military is only but one of, that, one of those elements. Um, and when a coalition comes together, that really does represent far more than just a, a military action. So when, it, when we form a coalition, there's normally, the way that it, it normally happens is um, the, there's normally one lead nation. It's not always the US. And there are examples where, um, certainly in, in my contemporary time, um, East Timor in 1999 was not a US-led coalition. It was an Australian-led coalition. That lead nation uh, normally sets this, uh, the, it, it takes the lead to set the standards um, for whatever the interoperability solution is going to be. That usually comes from that lead nation. Timor is an example, but also um, our recent operations in the Middle East over the last 20 years, the US has been the lead. Uh, and they've found uh, and taken on the, the largest burden for, uh, for coalition interoperability. So they provide, essentially in the Middle East, they provide the system in which the coalition operates on. It's funded and and supported um, through the lead nation, the US. Is that a good model? Uh, I'll leave it to my counterpart to, to talk about. But um, you know, where, where we want to get to is uh, through trust and through repetition and, and understanding each other, we want to be able to turn up once a, a governmental decision has been made to form a coalition in support of you know, wherever we are in the scale of conflict. You know, on the left-hand side, something low-level HADR sort of security operations, or if it's a full conventional warfare. We want to be able to form ad hoc and quickly, um, that people understand how to, how to come together and share information um, with the systems that they have uh, and the systems that they have in, sort of internally to their, to their own militaries. And the only way to really do that um, is to understand uh, each other and, and you know, what they bring to each, each coalition itself. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Thanks yeah. very much. Mike, um, so in that vein as well, when we're, when we're talking about operating in a coalition environment and, and determining what level of trust exists between the parties. Here's the, here's the question. How hard is it to operate in a coalition environment where you've got, let's pick an easy number, 10 coalition partners, um, to manage the different levels of trust, not only bilaterally, but in this case, multilaterally? Um, I'm presuming that just like in any other relationship, personal relationship, professional relationship, we all have folks that we trust more than, than others, and some we have zero trust. We don't have any basis to trust or distrust. It's just neutral. How do you operate, or at least to start uh, operating in that environment to, to try and bring the uh, playing field level 
or is it even important to have a level playing field? Well, definitely a challenge. Um, I know. I know when we evolve a relationship that a lot of cases, it's you know our ships when they're in the past when we we generated ships and that we tended to do a lot of stuff locally and now we're we're tending to generate further forward so that we're we're providing opportunities for more interaction with non-traditional allies and we're finding that the the operational commander like the ship CEO he's making some real um, on the spot judgment decisions with advice but on how he's going to evolve what he sh can share and what he should share to carry out his operation. So I, I think it's very much an evolving process. Um, we try to, as much as possible, it, it, you know, in, as our allies change and we, we try to embed staff officers. I mean, traditionally when I was in, in Europe with the Cana Canadian Army, I was embedded with a, a, a British uh, division and I basically did everything my counterparts did, but it allowed me to get a better understanding and we, we feed that information back. All our exercises, we're trying to increase the frequency of where we're, we're uh, um, embedding or doing exercises with non-traditional allies, and, and that's a big learning experience. Um, hope that answers. Well, okay, yeah, sure. Patrick, you want to take a stab at this as well? When, you, when we're talking about um, the relationships, and, and you, know, you, you may trust me more than I trust you. Is that fair? <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> um, well, I mean, it might be. Or, you know, and the other question is, trust for what? You know, for, what do, I, do I trust you with my wallet? Do I trust you with my house? Um, do I trust you with my top secret information? W that the, the reason to establish these uh, and determine and build on these trust relationships is, is vitally important before the balloon goes up. So you want to talk a little bit about Yeah, uh, about I, I think um, even behind that, so even if there's a, a political decision to form a coalition, um, and that's obviously been, at the political level that's been agreed, Sometimes um, the politicians don't always understand with the nations that form that coalition. It's sometimes the nations beyond that coalition. So, for example, you may get drawn into a coalition with, say, 10 nations. You understand how those nations operate. You understand their doctrine, and you can, you can formalize that coalition. You can have those relationships. But sometimes those nations, at both a political and military level, have relationships with other nations. And I think that causes sometimes a level of friction um, which can drive that whole trust element. It's not the fact that you not necessarily trust that nation, you probably do, but you may not trust one of their other coalition partners that are in a different coalition. Um, and I think that's a difficult area to manage because I suppose you could look at it from the context of despite the politicians have agreed, They've agreed nation to nation, but those militaries then are going to exchange information. And that information yeah, could be then quite damaging should it then be passed on to another nation. So trying to maintain that level of trust, understand um, those relationships, um, you have to dig in fairly deep, even at a military commander level, beyond the politics and say, well, if this information that I'm going to share, I'm going to trust you with this information, I'm going to trust you not to then you know, act beyond this coalition. Yeah. And I, I think that's the, 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 one of the most difficult areas that we have to face. Great, thank you. Um, so Aaron, in these uh, ever-changing and evolving, they're not static. These relationships are not static. Members of a coalition may not be static. In this ever-changing environment, how in the world, from a technology standpoint, do you start um, figuring out what technology needs to be brought to bear in this environment to enable coalition operations? Yeah, I think it starts with having a clear understanding <clears throat> of the mission, goals, and states and objectives. You know, what are the requirements from an information exchange perspective of what you're trying to achieve? And then with that clear understanding amongst both, you know, that lead nation and the other coalition members, uh, also understanding what those coalition members are bringing to bear. Um, as, as you look at um, you know, the technology that supports um, a coalition environment, um, it's really based off of what you're trying to achieve. So I, I would say understanding information exchange uh, requirements, 
um, having a clear understanding of those goals, mission, objectives, uh, end states will then determine what technology is needed and required to help meet that, you know, that objective. Right, Tim, who gets to set the, uh, the requirements then in a coalition yeah. environment? So I think uh, the lessons that we've learned over the last sort of 20 years, certainly when we're doing in, uh, entry operations, is um, you, can't, you can't plan in isolation from each other. So you've got to do, if you're going to do a coalition operation and um, you, you've got to bring the coalition together early in the planning stage so that um, we can set those requirements together. Um, certainly the lead nation, if, if, if they're the, um, bringing the most resources to it, then, then potentially they have, they have more of a say or more of a lead on it. But um, you definitely, it's, it's about early planning. It's about bringing the coalition together early in the planning stage and then set the requirements together. We had a workshop yesterday, uh, Patrick, around uh, risk management in a coalition environment. And I think um, in this same context of of managing risk and determining what assets the coalition needs, right, in, to, in order to perform its function, and the, the threats against those assets <coughs> forming. How do you start to have the conversation in a coalition environment about managing risk? Yeah, that's quite a difficult one, to be honest. Um, particularly from a CIS perspective, we've all got on national interests and we all buy different systems yeah, for our, that, that meet our own national requirements. Um, as found on previous coalition operations from a UK perspective, um, we've had to rebuild on every single coalition operation we've been on over the last 20 years at least, um, particularly at the operational IS level, i.e. the server stacks and everything else that you would deploy at least as far as maybe the, the brigade HQ kind of level in a land environment and also on the warships. We've had to rebuild these for every single operation, um, which is difficult and costly yeah, and, and quite awkward. Um, so trying to then build something that can is multi-purpose, multi-use, yeah, to mitigate against the risk of who are we going to be working with in the future. And it's not just the tech, it's the protocols, the security, everything else that goes on around it is extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah, Obviously, from a budgetary perspective, you can't just say, well, we'll build 5,000 of those and sit it on the shelf just in case we suddenly are called out on an operation. That isn't going to happen, and most nations are not in a position to be able to do that. Um, so I suppose for the, the really non-traditional coalitions, there's a huge element of risk. Yeah. How are we going to have some kind of reasonable information exchange that's safe and effective to meet the mission objectives? Yeah, and it is extremely, it's an extremely difficult area, and trying to to be honest with you, with the senior, um, particularly in the UK MOD, with the seniors I talk to, um, about the level of financial commitment to meet that risk, because that's what's going to mitigate against it. It will be a financial, a huge financial burden. Um, they're not always willing to accept it, to be honest with you, and they'll take it on risk of the fact that we won't be able to interoperate <coughs> at the level that would, we would need to to achieve those mission objectives. So I suppose it's don't worry about it, hopefully it won't happen. But unfortunately, it's quite likely to happen. So then you go into the whole, at least they are, I suppose, looking at it from a risk basis. Yeah, does that? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Hey, uh, so Aaron, um, in that vein, in, in your experience, um, how are we doing in a mission and partner environment? Um, we've, I think we've been at it formally for what, five years now? Um, that we have got vices in the background, obviously the NATO, the entire NATO experience, uh, but in the Indo-Pacific region, how are we doing in, in at least starting to establish and working through some of these baseline trust and risk conversations? So I think in, in this environment, um, one of the things that we do not benefit from in the Indo-Pacific that, that is relevant and, and already available in other um, uh, theaters is we don't have a, an alliance. And so similar out there in NATO that you have an alliance that allows for standards, for agreements, um, for, for like-minded countries to work together. We don't have that benefit out here in the <coughs> Pacific. And so the challenge is that there's rooted history of, of cultural sensitivities, um, partners that do not trust each other. Um, and, and so in our environment, we're, we're trying to establish some type of a, a theater um, architecture that allows uh, partners to come in and come out based off of what they can bring, 
um, into providing some of the capabilities uh, with respect to interoperability. Um, and, and I think you heard some of that yesterday with our w uh, way forward with, with MPE. Um, but, but also, um, how are we doing out here? Uh, I, I think it's, it's tough. Uh, also based off of um, technology and, and some of the partners' ability to uh, move as quickly as U.S. and some of the other partners that we have or allies within the region. Um, we, we are trying to uh, get after some of the uh, ability to, to share, collaborate, utilizing some of the existing systems that are uh, prevalent in other theaters. But uh, it's, it's slow moving, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Tim, you want to give your perspective from an Australian viewpoint? Uh, for, on, on MPE? Yes, please. Um, I think, again, you've, you've got to understand uh, how militaries purchase these, these sort of capabilities, right? Um, they, uh, it's, 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 the, the military will put out a, uh, like, an, like a need statement or, or draft up something that says, okay, this is the, this is the capability gap. Uh, and then it goes to government, and then government um, at the political level decides on how much resources is going to be applied to that, so how much money it's going to cost, whether that's worthwhile. And then there's a whole heap of um, other considerations uh, like, uh, you know, the, the system that you're buying, is, being, is it being built, uh, you know, from an Australian perspective, is it, is it being built on mainland Australia, does it create uh, mainland Australian jobs, does it? Um, so all of those factors come into play. Uh, when we're, it's not just net, it's not just a pure military decision. Um, that's probably the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I'd say is um, it's trying to connect uh, sovereign systems uh, which have been purposely built uh, by each of the, and in our cases, the Five Eyes countries. They've been built for a reason. They've been built to support an enterprise back in Australia, and then we want to try to connect that together at, on an operational level. That's really difficult because the um, the, the trust, the technical trust isn't necessarily there. So you've got to, you've really got to rely on those, um, those gateways, those high assurance gateways that they're going to work um, and allow the, the technology to support that, um, that environment. Um, so it's, it's yeah, we're, we're, I think we've still got a way to go. Um, probably the only, other, the only other thing I would say is um, at the different levels of war, um, so um, tactical, operational, strategic, uh, they all required uh, slightly different, or in some cases, vastly different technical solutions, right? So um, it, it's, not, it's not a one size fits all. At the tactical level, it's very much a line of sight. If you get the crypto right uh, and you get the waveform right, then people can talk to each other. The operational level, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's much more about being able to um, build similar data, um, uh, sort of similar data stacks in the area of operation and then allow them through a, through a sort of common gateway to, to talk to each other. And then at the strategic level, it's far more of an enterprise approach. So it's, 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 not, a, it's not a one size fits all. And depending on the level, depends on the decision maker about how, how we would do that, right? So at the tactical level, it's far more control at the military, but at the strategic level, it's very much a, it's a CIO policy governmental decision about how we get after that. Great. So, Patrick, collectively, um, maybe well, you all can sort of answer this question. Where are we uh, in the movie? It, say, it sounds like from there's a huge push to develop a technology solution to enable operations. And, of course, as you just pointed out, those operations can be any, any sliver. Any, you know, they, it, they can evolve and change constantly. How, where are we as far as establishing a technology base that would enable these coalition uh, environments, these changing coalition environments, to actually operate just from a technology standpoint. And then the second part of the question is going to be, and I think I already heard the answer several times, where are we in the movie as far as actually being able to use that now notional uh, enclave to operate <coughs> in and actually get information in that we trust and, other, and our members trust? So, Patrick, why don't you start? Uh, okay, so from a technical perspective, I'd Following on from what Tim said, yeah. obviously, and to be honest with you, we actually view the UK views it as four different elements, not really three. Um, it's to do with funding lines, unfortunately, and that comes into play as well. Depends which area the uh, of the grown-ups has the checkbook to obviously go and buy the stuff. Um, and the problem in the technology line is we are. Tim's right. We are. We obviously have a national interest in in, in trying to buy from our own host nations. 
And that makes logical sense. It keeps the politicians very, very happy. That all, doesn't always give the military the solution that they actually want to meet their initial user requirement. So there's a trade out straight away. Um, in most cases, if you talk to most um, people from the uniform side and say, what do you need to do this job? What is it you want? They've already, most of them are very clever. They'll say, I want one of those. Yeah, and that one of those may be made somewhere that may not be as desirable for your government as you would like it to be. Um, so from a technology standpoint, um, for example, I work on a program called LE Taxis. That's the UK's Land Environment Tactical SIS program. Um, that's a 10-year program to replace our tactical radio system um, and all the bits that go with it. Yeah, it's kind of sitting there all by itself. Um, we're looking at various vendors, various solutions. But unlike most pr large procurement programs, um, we don't actually have a prime systems integrator, and we're not going to have one. We are going to attempt to do this ourselves. Whether that works or not remains to be seen. Um, that then gives us an opportunity to take a more open look at it. So a delaminated, or we call it a delaminated open approach. Um, that What we actually mean by open is not this is all going to be open standards, because I can assure you after 40 years in this industry, there's no such thing in any shape or form. But what it does allow us to do is less look at integration and more looking at just being able to interface to people. I think that's one of the keys in this. That's one of the driving, driving ways forward to try and interface to people. Now that might sound fairly straightforward, putting aside security and crypto and other national interests. But if you can get it to that level so there's less integration and more interface, I think we stand a chance of actually getting somewhere with some of the technology. Okay, but once, let's presume we get the technology in place, where, where are we as far as enabling or using that technology? Where, where are we in the movie? Is, are, you, are, we at, in, in, are we at 10% or are we at 50% or? I think it, it, it depends is not it, the answer. No, no, it, 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 the, the co whichever coalition you're looking at. So yeah. for example, NATO. So NATO as a coalition is quite well formed. Everybody's got a say. Um, to be honest with you, most of the standards that you would see in the tactical CIS element are driven through by the Dutch, which is quite interesting. Um, they seem to be very vocal. They seem to want to get involved in all of the workshops and push stuff through. So, it's tr it, so in that movie, it's, it's well established. In other movies, in the Five Eyes um, enclave, that's well established. Yeah? In some of the non-traditional coalitions, it's not well established at all. Good. So I'd say in that movie, we are, the movie hasn't really started, and I think that's the problem. We don't actually also know when the movie will start. So trying to look at that from a risk perspective, who, will, who could any of the nations in this room go into a coalition with tomorrow? Yes, we could probably take a world political stab at it, but to be honest with you, that could change instantly. We could, UK could be in a coalition tomorrow, um, maritime, with a UK warship and a Japanese warship. That would be unusual, something we've probably not done before. So trying to get our head around that at this early stage, i.e., the movie itself, mm -hmm. um, the script's not been written, we've not really found all the actors, yeah, um, we don't really know what the plot is, um, it makes it extremely difficult. So I'd say, movie-wise, not started. Hey, well, good, perfect, thank you. Mike? I think, I think we know where we want to go, and I, I, I think um, data labeling's one of the ways we have to go to, <coughs> to facilitate the MPE environment, but the challenge is right now, I, I, um, in the static environment, a lot of systems are designed for people ashore and not moving anywhere and interfacing between different networks through uh, gateways and like the trusted network uh, environment. It's, it's not working well. I mean, you, you, can't it, it, you, you cannot attach stuff. You don't have uh, indication that a message has or an email has gone through. We tend to have to log into another server in, in, in the environment to, to share information. And then if you take it to the tactical level, a ship going out the door doesn't work well at all. And uh, that's uh, where you sort of at that, at that point, I think we know we need identity management. We need access uh, management. We, we need to uh, 
decide what people are allowed to see. We need the ability when a trusted partner is no longer so much a trusted partner, how do we roll back? How do we revocate, you know, revoke them from their privileges? I think um, we need to be able to audit what's going on. We've, we've done some looking at, you know, continuous monitor to see that big files aren't moving across the network for no particular reason. And, and we need, a, like I said, an ability to stop a particular partner from doing that. And, and to be able to still carry on, right? So I think we, I think we know what the requirement is. I think it's a real challenge as we go to the MPE FMN environment because it's, it's, it's hard stuff, right? And if you go into the Navy where we, t every couple of years when we do a rim pack or, or whatever, say we say we're going to exercise the satellite denied environment and that happens for a couple hours until it gets really inconvenient Right? And, and it, it's hard in, in the satellite denied environment where we might have one ship that does ha doesn't have access, the intent is to allow another vessel from another nation to use our infrastructure to bypass and to get relayed. And then, again, like I said, all of a sudden you have other nations you know, r right at your doorstep into your network or on the edge of your network. So we have to put things like host base intrusion detection and trust only goes so far, we still need to protect operational capability. Right, you, can't, you cannot allow your <coughs> unilateral uh, assets to, to be jeopardized in a coalition environment. But so Tim, I want to ask you the same question, but, but maybe also, um, you know, just make the observation, if the, if the movie hasn't started, if Patrick's right, um, maybe you can tell us who the executive director for the, <laughs> the storyline is. Um, who's actually responsible to be planning uh, and engaging, making these, helping in sure. a coalition environment, sure. making these determinations uh, in a shared risk? So I guess uh, from an MP MPE perspective, from an Australia, the way we look at MPE, um, it's, it's probably been best effort up until this point, so it's a, it's a bit ad hoc um, and best effort is really and I know that it's, it's starting to get a bit more direction and, and um, to allow uh, a bit more standardization so that, so that countries can sort of build their own part of that, uh, the MPE, and then, and, then, and then be part of it, particularly with your comments with the trusted network environment. Um, the, that environment is very much controlled by the, by the US side. Um, and so in order for us to um, have some sort of uh, just even just basically administrative control, um, what countries need to do is uh, understand how the trusted network environment works, um, so the Centrics and BICES um, uh, uh, um, systems, and then how, if you build your own um, enclave to that trusted network environment that you can administer and look after yourself um, with the help of, of the, the overall sort of administrators of the, of the T&E, um, then you can own a part of that problem yourself rather than relying on uh, a coalition partner to solve those problems for you. And that's sort of the process that Australia is going at the moment. So it's, it's early days. Um, what else I'd say about uh, MPE is um, so a, tr a true coalition uh, or a future coalition isn't going to fight off an extension of your enterprise. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't view future coalition operations to fight from your sipper net. Like that's, that's not... That's not how a coalition would, would, would fight. It will fight off some sort of partner environment at the operational level. You'll absolutely have um, sovereign um, IT systems like SIPA or our equivalent in, in, in Australia um, for your national C2 elements and your national and, and intelligence functions and definitely targeting and that sort of stuff. But, but the true information sharing and collaboration and war fighting network it's unlikely, certainly in the, in the future coalition in the Indo-Pacific, that it's going to be on an extension of your enterprise. It's going to have to be some sort of uh, well thought out but ad hoc network like an MPE where people can bring their own system and then connect up to um, and share both at, at the application layer but also to share information and share planning and, um, and, um, and fight the war via that operational network rather than the enterprise. I don't know whether that that totally answers the question. Maybe, maybe to my right might be able to back me up, sir. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to take a, take a different approach to the answer to the question. So you asked where are we at? 
um, to be able to use a capability. Where are we at in the movie? Um, and, and I would say it depends <coughs> on um, it depends on the country that we're talking about. You know, here in the Indo-Pacific, um, from a U.S. Indo-Pacom perspective, we have 37 different exercises that we track, and we actually exercise with between 22 and 26 different countries. And depending on that country, will determine where you are in the movie because that country. Uh, the, the relationship that you have, the operation that you're trying to achieve or the exercise that you're conducting will determine that the, the in-state scenario that you want to go. So we're at different phases for different movies with different countries trying to be able to collaborate, um, trying to be able to share information, and then also, uh, you know, exercise. Um, I, th I think in, in addition, you know, from a technology standpoint, um, are we trying to, you know, we talk about traditional IT here, but you also have to keep in mind the sensor to shooter. You know, are we doing, you know, uh, ISR? Um, is it just uh, purely about collaborating on an unsecure or secure environment between a bilateral or multilateral uh, nation? So all of those factors vary into where we are on the spectrum of what movie we're trying to, to watch. Uh, are we at the beginning, middle, or, or the end? Uh, I think with our more mature and, and capable partners, I mean, we're, we're, we're going toward the end looking at the credits of the movie because we've done things with these countries um, on multiple occasions where we've established protocols, procedures, technology to enable us to operate together. But others, we're, we're still at rolling the, uh, the title of the movie because we haven't had an ability to do that. So I would, I would answer the question that it varies. Um, I know depends wasn't the answer that you wanna, wanted to hear, but it really does depend based off of what we're trying to achieve with what country um, out here in this environment. You'd also say that those countries that are at the start of the movie, they're not ready to, to jump right in either. So the, the technical capacity isn't, isn't necessarily right. there. So you've got you've to build a network that uh, utilizes or uses the, the system that they're currently using. Right? So if that's an unclass or a, uh, a mobile network, um, you, know, it's, you know, potentially depending on sort of um, what the threat is to, or how contested the, um, the environment is from an e electromagnetic spectrum perspective at least. Uh, you've got to build a network that is able to um, interface with whatever your coalition partner is using. And, if, and we, in the FireWise community, obviously we're in, we're in the, uh, you know, the highly encrypted sort of um, space, that's where, we, that's where we operate in, but not all of the coalition partners are in that space. Great, thanks. So what, one more question for the panel, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. Um, so if you haven't sent your question in, now's the time to do it. I think we've got a, about a dozen already in. Um, so thanks very much for that conversation. Let's go back to risk for a minute. And, I, and obviously we talked about trust. We talked about managing in an in a, in a ever-changing environment. And we talked, to, I think, I talked about different levels of trust or starting from zero trust and then gaining trust and losing trust and working through that, those kinds of relationships. But when it comes to managing risk in an, op in an operational forum, who gets to make the call as to the way the, way the risk is going to be mitigated? And all, obviously uh, there are trade-offs in every mitigation center, scenario and there are resources, resource implications as well. But who in a coalition environment, is there a director, is there a person or entity that's always in charge and makes the final call when it comes to mitigating risk? Patrick. Um, in your experience, because this my, is based my, on your experience. experience sure, sure. So, so in my experience, the, the commanders in the field, nine times out of ten, will make a call on it. So if that means actually, at, if we talk about a tactical network, so these are troops running around on the ground, the quick and easy solution is to give the coalition partner your equipment. It's just not always acceptable, but just give them your equipment. Now that's been done for years, or bridge their equipment into your equipment, ignoring most of the security. If the, if, to be honest with you, I suppose it boils down to, is the juice worth the squeeze at that point? If you cannot, if you're in a coalition and people are throwing lead around, <coughs> at that point in time, some of the rule book gets thrown out of the window. Yeah, so it's, it's the local commander. Um, air forces tend to plan and deliver strategically, different game. Armies tend to plan and deliver tactically. So the local commander on the ground, that's why we have 
one star. So that's why we have brigadiers, yeah, to command on the ground. Yeah. And at that point then, that decision will be made, and I've seen it made numerous times to then offer, and that includes in places like Eastern Europe, with non, what we would have considered 20 years ago, absolutely people that we would not be in a coalition with, probably more likely to be facing mm -hmm. than be in a coalition with. However, because of current climates within or current political and, well, I suppose, a little bit of military going on in some of those regions, you have to then just take it. So that risk at, at that level, that may not always fit with the overarching political risk that was originally seen for that operation, that coalition operation. However, the commander on the ground, in my experience, will make the decision. Right. Mike? Our, our approach is very similar. I mean, our, I think our challenge is, um, Mr. Bob Stevenson, I think, speaking next, and he, he made a very good statement about uh, about network security and cyber security and that it's about you have to understand the science and we we've had situations where CEOs have made decisions on platforms especially the ships and that that yeah, if you understood the science you wouldn't wouldn't have taken that risk because it's not the risk for that specific you know the information is sure, sharing part I get you know and but sometimes there's risk being taken which isn't theirs to take because it, it, it's, you know, we're connected, right? So if you have data spillage or something, it's it's going to affect the whole and most people aren't going to know about it. So yep. that's that's the balance. Um, we, we give our commanders, you know, full license to do a lot of things and, uh, and we're continuing the education bit on the cyberspace and, and letting them be aware of some of the risks that they shouldn't be taking. So... But just almost always bad decisions are made when there's bad information. And so mm -hmm. the yep. commander doesn't have the, the understanding of the proper information. You can almost guarantee something's going to go sideways. Tim. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll, a couple of comments. Um, and I'm, I haven't uh, haven't had the opportunity to do any training, uh, sort of um, operational level um, schooling in, in any of the five eyes countries. So I can only... Um, talk to the Australian context, which is um, the way we look at it operationally is you do risk to mission, risk to force, and risk, uh, risk to reputation. And that's sort of the art of command, right? So at the tactical level, um, uh, commander needs to understand uh, how much, what their risk threshold is. Uh, and it's not always black and white. Some of it is very black and white. If we talk from a system, IT system perspective, it's, um, potentially it's, it's more black and white. But from a combat perspective, it's it, it's not always as, as easy as that, uh, and that's why I sort of say it's the art of command, where you can you can determine this is something that uh, a risk that I can accept, or whether it's something that you need to push up to to the next level, and that's um, that's sort of built into you as a as a uh, military commander as well as you go through your schooling and um, you you learn those um, to how to assess those three elements of risk, um, and uh, you can apply that those three elements of risk to an IT system as well. Um, and sometimes, if uh, if it's high risk of mission or force, then potentially, um, you know, that that level of risk needs to be needs to be pushed up. Eric, yeah, I mean, I would just concur with what my colleagues have said up here. Is uh, you know, the commander owns the risk, and, and it depends on the level. Um, well, depends on um, where that risk decision is made. Um, but a as you've alluded to, you know, risk has to be informed. Um, you know, understanding the problem, doing a risk assessment, and then uh, doing the mitigation measures and, and allowing the commander to make that decision uh, based off of operational necessity. Um, that's what they get paid to do. But again, it's our responsibility, responsibility in, in the IT world is to provide all the information so that they can make an informed decision um, based off of what level of a risk they're going to assume. So I, I, would, I would again say it's, it's at the commander level, but uh, there's multiple levels of command and it's just understanding at what level that they're able to assume risk uh, based off of their environment. All right, thanks very much, folks. Um, okay, we're gonna turn it over to uh, audience questions now. We've got about, we'll take about the next 20, 25 minutes for audience questions. Um, and if we run out of those, we'll come back up here to the panel. Can we have our first question? Yes, thank you, sir. And thank you to everybody in the audience uh, who has sent in questions, particularly to our students uh, who have sent questions in. We've received several. Uh, the first question for the panel, 
Now, do you see any evidence that adversaries are conducting information operations at the operational level to seed distrust among your coalition partners? All right, fantastic question. Um, so let's, let's take that right down the row. Aaron, you want to take that first? I think yeah. the short answer is yes. Um. Yeah. yeah, don't name names, but <laughs> maybe, maybe we can talk about a couple scenarios, um, if, but panelists, if you can see like what types of things we've seen in the, in the field trying to disrupt relationships. That's a <laughs> Man, that's not, it's not that hard a question. <laughs> what, 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 what do we see in World War II when our enemies were trying to disrupt our relationships? Or just sure, I'll, I'll defer to my, my coalition member to my left. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. This, this is uh, to me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, so it's, I, yeah. I think I think we're in a we're in a space of competition, certainly in the Indo-Pacific, um, and uh, or competition phase. I think uh, I think we we use. Um, and it's certainly at the operational and strategic level, there's, you, you, know, you only have to um, sort of read the paper to, to see where um, that level of influence is having um, across, the, across the Pacific in our sort of even, uh, we call them non-traditional, but I guess these days they really are uh, all of the Pacific nations from an Australian context, we sort of see them all as traditional partners. Um, uh, just happen to not be part of the Five Eyes. So, uh, information operations, uh, or informa yeah, uh, I would say in this sort of um, time of competition, uh, any of that sort of action is is um, sort of rooted in information operations. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay, Mike. Without getting into specifics, we we're just standing up our fleet cyber forces, and and part of the scenarios that we're building into our task group exercises is to exercise uh, uh, ship's crew's response to this sort of thing. On, so, you know, the, when we have ships deploy, the, the, um, depending on the tempo of the operation or exercise, I mean, ship's crew have access to social media. And uh, so we're, we're trying to make sure they're trained to respond in the right way and not take the rumor mill, because a lot of that happens on the social media side. So we're, we're actually using a lot of lessons from the US on the OPSEC side of the house, educating people more, um, putting the scenarios in place. Um, but specific um, info ops, I really can't go into. Mm -hmm. Pat? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yeah, every single day in Eastern Europe. Yeah. I won't now obviously name nations, but you can guess who's up to it. Um, we see it on a daily basis, um, not just at the operational level. Um, obviously, you can see it at the strategic level, but also now at the tactical level. So one of the things that, that, that certain adversaries will be very interested in is to get you off of your secure military system. Yeah? And they'll do everything they can to do that to get you onto a civil system, because once they've got you onto a civil system, they can basically do what they like with you. Um, so yes, it is prevalent, and um, I wouldn't say whether the UK would practice this on anybody, but I'm sure it's another system that you could, or another way of working that you could use, and I would expect, as our adversaries do this, that we do it right back. You know, you've got a situation where you've got uh, today what was a very complex scenario 10, 15, 20 years ago for information operations. Today with social media and the explosion of the ability to reach almost everyone simultaneously, um, the whole concept of disinformation uh, has really just exploded. And you, you all see that every single day. So adversaries being able to leverage that kind of access uh, to disrupt not only nations, but even our individual fighting units in our own countries. Well, I think to add to that, where a lot of nations now, UK are one, where we make an awful lot of use of open source intelligence. Yeah. So we're all going to do it because it makes logical sense to do it. It's up to date. It's up to the minute. Yeah. I mean, you know, in certain cases, for certain military operations that I've been involved in, the first thing we've known something's gone on is it's, it's appeared on Sky News before we'd even know about it. Yeah. So, you know, that's moved on now to, you know, <laughs> stuff popping up on the internet. 
but, but because we make use of that information and we might fuse that information, that open source information, with let's say non-open source information to create a picture for us to make a decision, um, that's one route in. So it's understanding that, that level of misinformation within that open source that you might decide to use, you might decide to fuse with your non-open source information to give, you, give your commander that opportunity to make a decision. Great, thanks for that question, audience. Next question. Thank you, the next question. Coalitions are often strengthened by shared or additive force capabilities. These vary over time as threats and capabilities change. Can you discuss how cyber capabilities may now help underpin today's coalitions? Mike, you want to take that first? <laughs> I'm just rereading the question, sorry. <laughs> I think um, we're really wrestling with, uh, w when we deploy ships out to sea, we're, we're wrestling with um, ensuring when a ship slips that it, it goes with a known good load and that, that are not, I mean, we, we experience uh, self-inflicted denial of service attacks from our national or enterprise uh, network <coughs> that we bring on board and we've, we've dealt with nationally so that we, will put in periods where they can't, unless it's an absolute emergency update, that they don't touch the ship, you know. But uh, the whole issue of uh, cyber, we're really trying to push towards that uh, we, we should be able to fight through a cyber attack. And I think most of our coalition partners, certainly our traditional ones, are, are trying to get to the same point that we, you know, that ship's crews are being taught how to, you know, TTPs, you know, if we have uh, issues with SCADA systems or command management systems or whatever, that we're increasing that level of capability and training of the crew so that we can, we realize that we're interconnected and we're, we're going to be, have to deal with cyber, so we, we're going to step up our game. And um, we've done a lot of... Uh, shared exercises with the United States. We sent we send a number of our, our uh, folks, uh, a couple teams down to cyber flag down Norfolk so that we could learn and, and build on our own capability. Okay, great. Um, I don't know that we all, all four of us, or you all need to take every single question. So yeah. Aaron, 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 you wanna take this? I'll, yeah, I'll jump in this. But one. feel free to jump in. <clears throat> so um, uh, traditionally um, with coalition, you, you had uh, coalitions are formed and, and those lead nations or those nations that have uh, the the ability to bring you know whether it's brute force or numbers was what we counted on to, you know from a coalition strength perspective now with the adaptation of, of cyber um, you can be a small nation but contribute as equally as large as that that lead nation because you have the capacity and capability to contribute so cyber today from a from a coalition standpoint um, those, those small uh, nations are now being viewed as equally as important as those large nations as we've had traditional coalition operations within at least the past 20, 30 years um, that I can think of. So being underpinned, it is, it is absolutely uh, uh, correct that um, you know, if, if there's capacity from a, from a nation to help contribute, you know, cyber is one of those force, mort force multipliers now that is, is enabling us to um, be a better coalition. Tim? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've got a, a, just one quick comment. Um, I, I was just saying to Colonel Osborne, I, I wish we knew who was asking the question so that we could target the, the answer a bit better. But we, um, uh, well, I, I answered by saying a philosophical point and then maybe something more tangible. Um, I think just saying cyber capabilities is really hard to answer that because um, cyber means so many different things to different people, right? So. If you ask a, if you ask a uh, like an infantryman what cyber is, his view of the view of that would be completely different to a ship's captain. Um, uh, so it's you, you've got to be very specific when we talk about cyber, what we mean. Uh, that's the philosophical answer. Uh, the the sort of more tangible one would be the way we get after it uh, is the is the the non sexy cyber stuff, right? That's what you've got to do best. That's what you've got to do first. The what people view cyber as is this is um, the offensive part of cyber, so the targeting part of it. Um, 
but ultimately that's that's a very small portion of it. The the part that you've got to um, that you've got to do right that underpins the coalition is the is the just the day to day cyber hygiene stuff. And if you get that stuff right in the coalition, that's the part that that has most value. You know, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I also think to add to that, um, one of the things that you'll see if you work with the UK at all is we discuss all of the time information advantage. Yeah, I think it, it's something that's thrown around by our seniors quite quite regularly. Information superiority, information advantage, information manoeuvre. Um, what we've realised quite quickly is obviously our potential adversaries are very good at cyber. I'm not saying we're not, but they are very good. Therefore, we are so reliant on that information to make a decision to co conduct a military operation. Um, in certain cases, and with some of our more traditional coalition partners, we've also looked at how do we operate when we have suffered a, some kind of cyber attack. Yeah, and it, I'm afraid it goes a little bit old-fashioned. Not always fight through it, ignore it, and go back to old-school ways of working. Mm. Yeah, so in, in essence, information advantage can very fast become information disadvantage. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that question, audience. Our next one. The next question. Um, in coalitions between countries that don't speak the same languages, how has technology helped with communications? Yeah, great. We're, we're all sitting up here speaking English. Um, that makes things sort of easy. What happens when you've got uh, coalition partners or organizations that really don't share common tongue? Aaron? Yeah, so I was, I was reading up on this a little bit last night and I saw a, a vignette that's really, uh, you know, it's geared toward the European um, region. And it was, uh, non, it, it was not allies that did not speak the language, you know. So I'll use that example, whether it's a Polish, Romanian, English, and, and so on, trying to do uh, joint fires. And because of the, uh, the capabilities that they brought, um, Technology has enabled us through interfaces to enable them to still uh, operate in their, their native language, but then uh, get the information that's needed uh, in order to do precision fires and strikes. So I think technology has, has greatly helped if used correctly and, and can be, again, a, a benefit with respect to countries that aren't speaking the same language, but ensuring that the, the correct message gets across. Yeah, as we talked about earlier, it's not just about language, it's also culture, right? So the, sometimes the culture might be the harder thing to overcome. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Let's take our next question from the audience, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is for Colonel Osborne. Could you explain the top two or three challenges you face in coalition operations in your theater absent a large formal alliance like NATO? So I, I think uh, one of the, the first ones is the, uh, the differences in technology and maturity from the different countries that are operating here within the, uh, this theater. Um, uh, you know, with a, with a uh, formal alliance like NATO, um, there is, there's, as I said earlier, there's agreed upon standards, um, there's agreed upon technology capabilities, there's agreed upon um, uh, uh, modernization as well. And so within this theater, as we look to, you know, form a coalition, and again, it depends on what the operation that's required, we'll determine what that nation brings to bear. And, and so we have to determine how we're going to operate, collaborate, um, and, and really uh, try and, and, and go to the lowest common denominator, but then allow, you know, our operational commanders to, to determine which risk they're going to assume with respect to how they're going to conduct that operation. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the biggest ones. Uh, the other one is, is trying to get everyone to a common standard. Um, I, I think, a, again, as, we, as, as there is a, a sense of mistrust, distrust, and, and cultural differences and sensitivities, um, we, we do uh, are somewhat challenged when we're, with respect to all of the different nations here in the theater. So uh, coming to a, a, a common standard and agreement, because there's no formal alliance, is somewhat challenging. Um, there's there's uh, more mature nations that, again, because of uh, cultural um, misgivings or grievances that haven't been resolved, um, though they are mature, they're, they're less likely to work together. And so we're having to use different technologies and capabilities to try and bring them, you know, together in a, in a coalition. Aaron, ni a nice job. And Tim, thanks for sending that question in. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> 
All right, thank you, sir. Uh, the next <coughs> question is for Mr. Baker. Uh, you said there is a need to interoperate down to radios on people, but this is years away. Besides money, what is needed to enable this? <coughs> well, to be, on, to be honest with you, not just the money to make this happen, we'd all have to buy probably very similar radios with the same waveform, with the same crypto. Yeah, and we all have, we all sl operate slightly differently. So it will probably be years away at this point. So it's not a point, it's a, an area I believe that we should interoperate at. So the program I work on is about five billion pounds. What's that? I don't know what that is in dollars. It's quite a lot, I think, to replace the UK's tactical system. Um, it would be easier, particularly in a coalition operation where we're using mixed forces on the ground to be able to interoperate at that level. One of the examples I could give you to interoperate between United Kingdom Royal Marines and French Marines who were one mile apart on a beach in Corsica, um, I had to add green boxes to warships and it did about five SATCOM hops halfway around the world to just exchange a blue dot on a map, <laughs> which is utterly ridiculous, to be honest with you. However, unless we all bought the same system um, at the tactical level, we're probably not going to go anywhere. There are a few NATO pushes to look at standard NATO waveforms and potentially standard um, NATO cryptos, at least at that level, but that's not going to solve a problem for a non-traditional coalition. I hope that answers. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, that, that's how we actually do it at the moment. Mm. But in that context, they were dissimilar systems. Yeah, so what we actually want to do is try and exchange. And don't forget, they will want to take the exchange of that data and put it into their operational IS system. If it's on ours, theirs won't appear on our operational IS system. So it's not quite that simple. Everybody's got their tiered systems that react with each other. Yeah, and they wish to maintain that for national interest. And their own crypto. Yep, yeah, and their own crypto. <laughs> I'll also add the if we go back to what we said about how we do procurement for military, um, it's not just the military that get to decide what radios we want to purchase. As, a, as an example, you can apply this to anything that military purchases. So in the French context, um, they're going to they're purchase something which is French sovereign. That's, that's where they go, right? So although it'd be great if everyone purchased, if, you know, we're in the US, so everyone's going to purchase Harris radios, right? And all the coalition, everyone's running around with multi-million dollar Harris radios, it'd be great. Because then we can all interrupt with each other. But the problem is, is that the French government or the, the British government, um, potentially that's, that's, not in, that's not in their political um, appetite to do that. That's why we, as a military, have to find ways to, to interop um, with the systems that, that we've purchased. Yeah. And you can apply that to, to not, I've just used the radio example, yeah. but it, it, it applies to pretty well all IT systems. That applies to absolutely and everything. Yeah. And even if you take this to what we would consider to be open standards, um, and I did say earlier on there's no such thing, um, even if you used an open standard such as voice over IP, yeah, so if you used the ITU recommended voice over IP, if you were to buy that from a French manufacturer, there will be pull-throughs from older French protocols which you wouldn't find out until after you bought it. I know I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Thanks for the follow-up question as well. Uh, next question from the audience, please. Thank you. The next question is for the, uh, the panel. If we consider coalition interoperability an important and fundamental input to capability in going forward within this region, how do we encourage partners with less technolog technological baselines to get involved and remain valued partners without being overbearing? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can go first. I'll, I'll just throw one comment. Um, we sort of talked about this, which is uh, you've, got to, you've got to integrate with the systems that they have. That would be the first thing I'd say. So you've got to, you've got to understand how, um, how they are operating um, and how they're using their technology that they've, that they've purchased, that their government has provided resources for them to go out and purchase, and then you've got to understand that, and then you've got to try to integrate that with, with your systems. Um, we're not always going to be a high-end... Um, five eyes um, sort of solution, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. So you've got to try to 
and if it's and if it's using unclass means, then you've got to try to bring that into some way to fuse that um, to make it a, an operationally usable system. That'd be the, the sort of opening comment I would say. I mean, we've had even within our own nation, if we've been working with the Coast Guard, we've had to send flyaway kits across because of the interoperability issues and, and with riders. And I th we still do that with coalition partners at times. So it depends on, you know, how how much of a rising is it? Is it a short notice thing? Sometimes we'll we'll send the kit and an operator and and take it from there. Aaron, you want to lay on? Sure. So I think it it depends on how much risk. Um, we want to assume as both a coalition and or a sovereign nation. Um, with, with respect to uh, knowing the various levels of technology that partners may bring. Um, with, without being overbearing, um, if, if there is inherent risk to a national system or capability that may cause a loss of lives, we're not going to be as, as willing to take a less capable partner and, and their technology into that coalition operation. Um, so we may provide that capability for them to be interoperable. Um, that, that sometimes is, is the least risky, but it may be uh, a most costly uh, way to get after it. But, um, you know, there's, the, there's always uh, taking into account risk um, to your own national um, uh, system sovereignty and then weapon systems and platforms. Um, and we, we deal with this in the Indo-Pacific a lot uh, with respect to the different and the varying levels of uh, technology uh, within countries, um, but without trying to be overbearing, um, we're going to make sure that we have our own national interests um, uh, in mind a as well and try and express that as politically correct and, and sensitive as, as possible. But also being able to explain why um, we from a, from a U.S., if you will, are, are modernizing our capability based off of threat and not just because we want to modernize because of dollars, right? So being able to be up front, up front and forthright with a partner uh, helps them make some of the decisions that they need to make if they want to be a part of a coalition operation or an exercise in the future as we've uh, increased our uh, capability and technological advantage. Great. Okay. Uh, last question. Um, we've got some 14 to 17 year olds sitting in the audience today. Um, what advice do you have, and maybe each of you take one or two minutes with this, please, um, to them as far as, you know, what are the key takeaways from, from a relationship standpoint, from a coalition standpoint, from a trust standpoint, that they should take away from this presentation? And what advice do you have them from a, from a career standpoint? You know, they're all in uniform right now, so maybe the first piece of advice is stay in uniform, but I'd like to hear from each of you. Aaron, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so, so what advice I would give you, um, as you as you sit here and you look at this coalition panel, um, understand that relationships are important. Uh, and, and that underpins everything that we do with respect to operating in a multinational, multicultural environment. Understanding uh, the sensitivities and the, uh, the background for, for where our partners, um, those that are up here and those that are here within the region come from, helps go a long way with respect to operating uh, together. Um, so, so that is one of the things I would say take away from, from this panel and this discussion is that you know, relationships help drive interoperability. And, and that's at the national to the personal level a, as well. As you look out towards your, your future, um, I, I would say if you're interested in the military, then I, I think that's a, a, a great uh, opportunity for you. As someone who's been doing this for, for 25 years, but you know, 30 years in, in uniform, I, I will tell you, never in my wildest dream did I think I'd be here this long. Um, my opportunity was to, to get out of the house and to actually go to college. I just happened to go to a military college and, ha and, and then join the military after that. But you know, the, the, the opportunities are there. Uh, and you know, from those who are up here who both are still in uniform and out of uniform, I think you know, one of the greatest things that we've done is to help s serve our, our nation, um, and and that is uh, is something I would say. If you want to do that, then then please you know continue on. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Tim. Uh, I would say um, this is maybe this is controversial. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> don't, don't just <laughs> go for it. 
Uh, don't just accept everything that we say as, as fact. Um, so you should, you should be thinking about how to challenge the ideas that the, that the four of us put out. These are our opinions on, on how to, um, you know, on your questions or on the, the topic that we've talked about. That doesn't mean that, um, that everything we say is 100%, is um, you know, it's not necessarily the answer. There, potentially there are no answers to the questions that you're asking. So you should try and challenge those ideas. So when you go forward into, if you're going to go into a military career or if you're not, if, you, if you're going to go on and do further schooling or a civilian career, um, don't just accept everything that, because uh, it's in colour, then, then it's true. That w that's what I would say. That's the thing that I've learned over the years is try and, try and challenge those ideas. Sometimes they're right, but sometimes you find that they're not. Um, advice from a military perspective, uh, like what Colonel Osborne said, it's been almost 20 years for me um, and... Um, you know, the military has provided a sort of a misguided kid who didn't think he was going to, you know, amount to much to giving me a whole heap of experiences that, um, that I, I certainly, I, I really value a lot. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. And if it's something that you want to do, then go out there and get after it. Yeah, definitely. That's up to me now. Um, <coughs> I, I think one point I... I've served in, you know, I spent four years in Germany, a couple of years uh, of that with the British Army. I've uh, been. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, but uh, I would say, you know, it's going on the theme about relationship building, understand, take the time to understand the nuances of culture, like learn another language. I mean, if you go to Europe or, you know, I've been in meetings and, you know, I was on a, tra actually I'll tell you about it, I was on a train from Basel, Switzerland to Barcelona, Spain, and, and on, the, on the way, actually on the way back, we, we had a bit of a rough go on the train, and early in the morning we're sitting there having dinner in the dining car, and the waiter spoke six languages, and I go, I feel like an idiot, you know, like, I, I mean, in Canada we're lucky if you can, I mean, as a senior officer you have to learn French and be functional in French, in Germany, when I went across to Germany and, and served with the Canadian Army, the, there was so little exposure, I didn't learn any German. I went, uh, when I went up north with the Brits, I lived on the economy, I learned German, and I went, and there's lots of nuances. I, I was in a conference and I thought, this coalition partner really isn't participating here, and then later on that same partner took me aside and asked me a bunch of questions and shared a bunch of information, but their culture prevented them from embarrassing me in public, you know, and it, it's, anyways, I would say, you know, the, the world isn't just uh, English, right? I, I really think it's important to try to, to at least understand the nuances of culture. Thank you, Mike. Pat. Okay, so after, well, I'm probably the oldest, well, one of the oldest. <laughs> you look the oldest. Close. I look the you oldest. Look <laughs> So after an extremely interesting career, which started life with a radio strapped to my back and a Morse key on my leg, running around like a lunatic, um, the military gave me an opportunity to travel. I speak Portuguese, which is quite weird for a Brit, because um, I served with NATO in Portugal for a number of years. Um, I would, to take away from this presentation, I'd agree with Tim, challenge everything. You know, not, not everything you see, challenge it. That's the key to getting through, particularly if you're going to go into the military. Challenge everything. Or do you even do it in your everyday life. Don't be afraid to challenge it. Yeah, everything you see, everything you want to do. As far as trying to excel in the field, well, we're all a bit six. We're all a bit calm, so it's a, it's a bit cheeky, to be honest with you. But having started life with a radio on my back and a Morse key on my knee, um, and then the military helping me with my education, um, I've gone from that to multiple professorships in universities throughout the world. So you can take this as far as you want to take it. You can make your military career be what you want it to be. You've just got to make the effort. Fantastic. So um, panelists, thank you so much for your uh, participation. I think, uh, Jeff, you're going to come up and talk about the, the, the gifting. And we've got a, a coin that I'll be presenting to you. But audience, thank you very much for your engagement, your participation, and your attention. Um, over to you, Jeff. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, and thank you all to the panelists, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Baker, and, and obviously our moderator, David Buckley. Um, thank you again. For me, I've been working, obviously, within 
Indopaycom J68 for a couple of years, and I'm trying to understand this. It is a very complicated question. As you discussed, there's trust, there's culture, there's technology. We've got some cyber thing. There's a lot of new things happening. It's not an easy subject. We kind of throw around interoperability like it's just an easy word. But as I've seen over my few years being involved, there's a lot more difficult and a lot more to talk about and I think a lot more to learn. And the way we learn is by creating what we have done over this past few days for those who have participated in our coalition interoperability forum is to have a community of interest to have these discussions. Someone said earlier, and it was said after our first one that we did in April, there wasn't a lot of participation from our coalition partners. I can tell you it's not for a lack of trying, and it will grow, but I think, again, it's difficult. And a lot of times people look at the U.S. maybe as, yeah, we're trying to control everything. We're not. We're trying to create a forum. There was just one in Australia last week in Canberra, and there were a lot of folks there as well talking the same discussions. I think it's happening. I think we need to continue that. And I really want to, again, thank our young um, ROTC, JROTC, JROTC students who are here. I know a few of you weren't here earlier, and I will recognize you in a second, but I did want to let our panel know that as for FCA Hawaii and FCA International, we will be making a donation in your name for Toys for Tots. So right. I want to thank you again for thank that. You. And we do have a coin for each of you, which we'll give you afterwards. So thank you again for your time, but also thank you for taking the, not only the time here, but the time to get here. It's not easy coming from UK or from Australia. Canada, a little bit easier, but we're still, again, in the middle of the Pacific. So again, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. And at this moment, two other um, remarks just before we recognize the students and then we'll be done. One is the breakfast buffet starts. It's sponsored by Karasov. We'd like to thank them. It will be on the exhibit floor. It starts at 9.30, which is right now, so you can go down and get something to eat. Also, the J6 panel will be in this room at 10.15. Uh, it will be obviously our J6 and some of his um, six components will be speaking. Uh, information warfare, maximizing cyber capability and effects within all domain operations. Well, when we talk all domain operations, what are we talking about? We're probably talking coalition interoperability. I'm sure it will be discussed. Uh, as we've all said, we're not going to any sort of conflict or a foreign humanitarian assistance without a coalition. So again, that topic and that theme keeps coming up. Lastly, there are three uh, schools that were not here this morning that did take the time to get here, so I'd like to recognize them and ask you to stand up when we do, and then we'll conclude. Uh, the first one is IAEA High School. <laughs> Second one is Lelehua High School. And our third is St. Louis High School. Thank you, everybody, and we're going to conclude, and aloha. <laughs>